Hello and welcome to another spoiler episode of Umaneko. This is going to contain full spoilers for the entirety of the game. I am basically going to be talking about full big reveal stuff while just discussing these particular sections of the playthrough. So don't keep watching if you've not played the whole thing. In this section, we we begin with a very throwaway line that really has me trying to chess maneuver, figure out exactly what's going on in multiple people's heads. The narration says, I heard that in the end, our parents were unable to get grandfather to respond. Which, especially with later when we see the parents again talking, I had to really think about what exactly is going on in their heads? Because again, all of the siblings know without strictly speaking knowing that Kinzo is dead. So... From what I can gather, what just happened was they all marched up to Kinzo's door. They demand Kinzo answer. Kinzo, obviously, says no words whatsoever. At this point, all of the siblings, well, siblings minus Kraus, certain that Kinzo being dead means that he is not involved, are basically strong-arming Kinzo, strong-arming Kraus to say, Listen, we're effectively blackmailing you, slash cornering you so that you have to continue your lie even when it's disadvantageous to you, but either you reveal that Kinzo is dead, or you accept the validity of this letter that says that someone else could become the family head. And given those options, Christ still picks the family head. Him and Nazi are still dedicated to the Kinzo being alive narrative, even as it's increasingly clear that it's just nonsense. But the part of that that really had me doing mental flips is this means that reading this letter, the other siblings know Kinzo is dead and know Kinzo has not sent this or given this any approval. So it means that they are baffled by the letter because they're trying to figure out what this 19th person is looking for. They're reading this going, okay, so what? seriously, what could she want? And then, as we will see later, they come through the conclusion of, oh, she wants to buy off the family headship because she does know where the gold is. And the epitaph as a riddle is a kind of taunting challenge for them. It's just a really funny single line that encapsulates the multiple layers of bullshit happening in terms of their maneuvering, where Ava and the where Ava in particular, because it's obviously her episode, is simultaneously aware Kinzo is dead, asserting that he's alive and he's therefore giving this credence because that is advantageous to her, because she wants to become the head, even as they are going to solve the riddle in an attempt to get the gold, because money is what they all want, but actually the headship is what Ava wants. We'll see this all bound up even more later, but just the multiple layers of different impulses, desires, and lies that these that this family has to maintain is just a mess. And there is a funny moment when we see the siblings talking about it, where it says that after spinning their wheels a bunch, they finally acknowledge that they should not doubt each other and work together, and. The narration is surprisingly tactful about it, whereas Ava is just straight to the point of Kraus has been doubting all of them. Kraus thinks the letter's from one of them, and they're all just trying to be like, no, cop the fuck on, somebody else wrote this, so we need to deal with that person as a united whole. <laughs> Which again, given that there's multiple layers of things, they're not truly united because how much is Kraus gaining and how much is Kraus losing when they're in search of gold that they're not 100% sure exists, even if Kraus is confident himself that it exists. In theory, Kraus is the only one losing something by giving up the headship, whereas we know that's actually is more complicated and weird. Also, as I said last time, gender is extremely here in this episode, and recurrently you can see moments where the siblings have reactions that are strongly informed by their gender and the gender of the person they're talking about. When they talk about their mother and her suspicion about Kinzo having a secret mistress, Rudolph says, Mom was totally paranoid in her last years. 
She'd sometimes suddenly start making a fuss, asking the servants to start looking for dad immediately because of some urgent situation. Which is interesting that he would call her paranoid, say she's making a fuss, when all of them are quite comfortable in asserting that Kinzo did have a secret mistress that he hid in a second mansion on the island, perhaps. With something that ludicrous, with the way they talk about how ridiculous Kinzo could be, how can you call that paranoid? Except, of course, if you're just thinking of her as a foolish woman, and she's making a fuss, and not like, oh, I'm trying to catch out my ludicrously sneaky and obtuse husband, who is clearly uninterested in me, and has some secret shit going on I want to find out about. Because he did, she was right to do that, and it's unfortunate she did not discover the truth. Or well, as far as we know. Again, her lack of character is very interesting. I'm, I don't know if any of the extra, like the extra episodes or manga or anything goes into her at all, but she is constantly a presence that is just never seen or visualized or even heard from, really. But anyway, by contrast, Ava's reaction is, Yes, that did happen sometimes. Mother was, mother was always doing things like that in her later years, and that frightening atmosphere still hasn't gone away. I can't say it for certain now. She was a person to be pitied. Ava has sympathy, maybe not the most compassionate sympathy when it's pity, but she has sympathy for her and is not damning her mother's choices because at the end of the day, she, again, thinks Kinza was doing some wild shit and her mother was probably just trying to figure out what's going on. But this is not the only time where just little moments like this will happen. It's a constant reminder of the ways in which the various women, especially Ava, feel like they need to be on guard and be on the offensive in order to prevent this kind of stuff being used to just undermine them thoroughly. And there's an interesting kind of extrapolation from that where you also see a lot of stuff about age and maturity coming from Ava, and particularly from Ava to Rosa, either about Rosa herself or in previous episodes more so about Maria. And it's a little bit fascinating that Ava, lacking the cudgel of gender, she cannot berate Rosa for being a woman because that only undermines herself, really. There are times in which Ava will use gendered expectations, like for instance saying that Jessica is not fit to be the head. But overall, it doesn't work to her advantage very often, but age does trump things for her. She can refer to Rosa as being young, immature, foolish, because Ava contrasts herself against Rosa in those moments, and that is a way in which she can establish a hierarchy that's clear, and she can use that same hierarchy against and she can use that same hierarchy against Rudolph, because we know she did bully Rudolph and he did not have a good time with her. And obviously gender was not a way she could put herself above him, but age and intelligence? Sure. We get a line that uh, repeats the kind of interesting math that often gets used metaphorically in certain situations. Taking care of a person in secret over a period of 30 years would it be an incalculably massive task. Now, it's not literally spelling out the math, but it is literally using the word incalculably and talking about a period of 30 years and kind of implying the multiplicity of how difficult that is. If you think about hiding something for one day, not that difficult. Hiding something for a year is 365 times as difficult. Hiding something for 30 years is 365 times 30 times as difficult, which at that point is a vast number. And the idea that it had still been kept secret all that time, difficult to fathom. Especially because we know that, in fact, that's not the case. We do, in fact, get to hear from Rosa later how she actually discovered Beatrice because the island's not that large, and even with all of the secrecy and the layers of protection, there's a whole family here who might just stumble into Beatrice. And the unfortunate truth hiding behind this statement is 
Kinzo has not kept a secret mistress for 30 years. He kept a mistress about half that time because Rosa accidentally caused her death. After which point, Kinzo had a secret mansion, but not a secret person. And any of the activity that would reveal that there was a person there, anything that makes it more difficult than just having a mansion no one knows about, all that stuff goes away at that point. And one last thing from this big sibling conversation that is a little bit funny to me is when Kyrie is talking about their... When Kyrie is trying to analyze Beatrice's motivations and her maneuvers, she says that technically Beatrice's challenge makes no sense until you invoke a certain type of emotion called arrogance. And then Ava's like, oh yeah, yeah, I've got that too. I can, I can see that. The parallel's absolutely there. And I think I've said before, but one thing I find, one read I find compelling is that Beatrice is quite self-consciously modeled on some of the Ashuramiya's behavior, in fact. And it is not purely a parallel, but in fact, inspiration. And this moment in some ways feels like it eggs Ava on to accept the challenge, because even if pragmatically simply taking the money is actually what she should do, Ava does not want to rest for that. Ava has spent her whole life pushing herself to try and achieve more than what she is being set out, and I don't see why she should act any differently in this situation. Then we get some of Badler talking to Beatrice about the number of people on the island. And in general here, there's a thought I had about how Badler is and where Badler sits, there's an interesting thing about the fact that Badler is exactly 18 years old for the events of Rock and Jima. He is on the cusp of being a child and being an adult. I've talked before about how the fact that whether or not you're an adult is a fuzzy definition and often people bestow it or take it away based on whims. Rosa is obviously an adult. She is has a child, she has a business, which is a little but she is still often treated like a child and immature. So simply being 18 years of age is not equivalent to being an adult or not equivalent to wholly being an adult. Because of course, even George often will belie the fact that he is not fully an independent adult because he's still using his parents' money. He's still working in his dad's company. He has a dependence on them that has not gone away. Battler is in an interesting spot. He is very childish, very naive, but in some good ways. Unlike George, for sure, Badler has a very pure belief in everyone. He refuses to accept that any of the 18 could be culprits. As we see through the different arcs, lots of them could be driven to be accomplices or to be complicit in murders going on on this island. But Badler refuses that. Badler insists that there is no chance that any of them could possibly be doing such a thing. And this childishness is a cynicism that the adults lack, because at the end of the day, lots of them could imagine situations where their siblings would turn on them, because they have to, because they have to be defensive. Badler is not at that stage. Battler is still in certain senses an adult. Battler has become critical of his family. He distanced himself from his father to go live with his grandparents instead for a while and has since returned. This is a kind of return to his family. But unlike George, that gives him a certain degree of not independence in the strictest speaking financial sense, but that Battler hit the eject button. He was willing to walk away in a way that George, I couldn't imagine doing. George, I could very easily imagine constantly having a tie to his parents, even as he becomes more independent and not fully cutting the thread. All of this to say that in some senses, Battler is perhaps the perfect participant for Beatrice's game because he has enough of the childish naivety to believe in both his close family, that he, even though he knows some of them are shitty people in certain ways, 
but also to just believe in servants, including ones he did not meet before this very weekend. It's not just loyalty in this case, he simply just believes in them. And that's very compelling to Beatrice. And then, in general, with Hempel's Raven, we get a fairly clear delineation of how some rules of logic and argumentation, or rules of debate, are uselessly nonsense for real life because they are correct, quote-unquote, for the sake of the game, but the very notions that they're espousing are questionable a lot. They work if you accept the premises of the game, but they fall apart in real-life scenarios where the premises of a game do not match. I mean, I've talked about it with the wolves and sheep puzzles and so forth. <laughs> to take the simple example, here are two boxes. One has a cookie inside and means you win. The other is empty and means you lose. So, if it has a cookie inside, you win implies you do not win, it has no cookie inside. Beatrice herself calls this out when talking about the example of having two boxes, one cookie inside being the winner box. She says, As long as we accept the premise that there are no more than two boxes, the contrapositive shows that the other box is automatically the winner. This is the part where you need to accept the premise. Because, for instance, what if you've been cheated and neither box contains a cookie? What if you've been cheated and there is in fact a third box? What if you were told one box contains a cookie, the other, nothing? Maybe the other refers to multiple boxes, and in fact you've had a box hidden behind the person's back while they just show you two empty boxes because they are lying and tricking you. Or because what you consider a box is not necessarily the two objects sitting in front of the person. In some ways, yes, these poking holes are a little bit ridiculous, but it's worth remembering that the premises of these things are only based on the assumption that everything does fit neatly into boxes and that things are not more obscure or hidden, even when it's not intentional. Because when it comes to Baudelaire's later analogy of the 18 people on the island being boxes and then the theoretical 19th person and their box, that breaks down quickly because, for one, Kinzo's already dead, Battler just doesn't know it. For two, Beatrice, Beatrice, Shannon, and Cannon are all people who share one body. And for three, something I'm going to get to later with the actual red truth about this, what counts as being a box? Are they people? Are they living people? Are Shannon and Cannon in the one box? Or are they not? I would argue they're not, and I think Battler would agree once he understands, and would agree obviously in this moment, but there is a way in which you could view the situation, deeply disrespectfully, and, that, and assert that there's simply one box for the body that they share. And as I said, this is before you even get to Beatrice herself obfuscating things and intentionally tricking Battler or messing with him. You can't simply accept the premises when it comes to real life, because in real life, things are messy. Things are not neatly divided and separate and clear. And of course, this both is a story and is very self-awarely written as a narrative, as a murder mystery or fantasy, depending on the situation and scene. But it is speaking also to real life, and it is making it clear that when it does make things, neatly categorized, or when it does make things fit into rules of logic, that is because it's a story. And the real events of life that it alludes to and that it is metaphors for are not so simply defined. And of course, Beatrice is extremely hesitant about using red truth to counter Battler. Battler himself calls out that if she just uses red truth to say it was one of the 18, She's pinning herself down, and as far as Bandler is concerned, that would be proof that she does not exist. Now, obviously we know that strictly speaking, Beatrice could have just said something like that, and maybe with a more loose phrasing of one of the 18, have still left room for herself. But even so, I think Beatrice spends quite a while struggling here because she doesn't know how to verbalize her situation. 
does she consider herself a distinct person? How does she factor in Kinzo and Bagler's, and Bagler's awareness of Kinzo? Does she acknowledge the notion that she doesn't consider herself a person and neither does Shannon nor Canon? What word does she do use to describe person? Because Badler rejects the notion of furniture, Badler is demeaning to the notion of a witch, he insists that she is simply another person. Badler flattens all of these divisions that are used to obfuscate people's situations because to him everyone is equally valid. Whereas Beatrice does not feel that way because she does not feel that everyone has an equally valid chance of being a person. And without literally saying all of this, how can she set up a situation where she limits his belief in there being a 19th body on the island and still not give away the game and still not give up on herself as being a person? And it's interesting to see her struggle with this for some time. In some ways, Badley sees this as, oh, I am clearly right. When actually the situation is that Beatrice is trying to figure out how she can retain ambiguity despite using the Red Truth. That's one of the interesting things about the Red Truth as a blunt instrument because it is, quote unquote, objective fact and harsh and specific. And yet, Beatrice often uses it to retain ambiguity by talking around ambiguous things, by using objective facts to make it seem as though something is pinned down very concretely without having to reveal her hand. Also, brief math check-in for yet again Badley saying, when talking about using the red truth about the number of people on the island, That'd be the same as admitting that she's something that can't exist in this world, like an imaginary number. Sorry, Badler, again, imaginary numbers are real. They are a thing. They're called imaginary or irrational because of how they are represented in mathematics, but they're very important to how calculations are done. They're not fake. They're not made up words. They're not made up symbols. They're simply kinds of mathematics that are expressed in a different fashion that are difficult to ex they're difficult to simplify because they're obscure in strange ways uh, I'm not going to give a math I'm not going to give a math lesson both because I <laughs> don't remember enough to say that and I don't think anyone cares to hear it but it is Amusing that Battler claims it as a, oh, this nonsense thing that's not real, when it is quite literally a specific category of thing that is very real and important, even if it is categorically different to what are called real numbers. And then one last thing I do want to mention is just a brief bit more of the sexist and gendered ways people talk to each other that I think is a very interesting dynamic, because... When Rosa is kind of distracted during their discussion because she's thinking about the woman that she knows died, Ava is like, get your shit together, you're a mother, you should be in this fight, what are you doing? And then Rosa's apologizing, while Kreis is like, hey, if you're tired, you should go rest, go take care of yourself. This is another gender expression of things, because even if on its face it seems like it's just Christ being nice and Ava having barbs out as she often wants to, uh, as she is often wont to do, under the undercurrent here is that Ava's like, hey, you should be doing more, you're capable of more than this, you should step up, you should be active and not passive, whereas Christ is like, no, being passive is kind of what you're for. If you need to rest, if you're a frail woman, go rest up and you'll be fine. Obviously, neither of them is aware of the actual circumstances under the hood where Rosa's struggling with a trauma and whether to even bring it up. But it is interesting that their default assumptions are in opposition because of what they think they should expect of a person because of her gender. 
And obviously, in part, there's a lot going into their expectations from Rosa. Rosa is someone who fulfills her gender role, broadly speaking. Rosa is someone who steps down as the youngest sibling. There is more than just her gender informing things in this situation. But especially with Ava in this conversation, it does feel as though this is a moment where Ava pushes Rosa to step up as a woman. That is going to do it for now. Next time we will be talking about Rosa's story and I think we're gonna have a lot to bring up there. But that's all for this video. Thank you for watching and see you next time.